Sophie, thank you for coming on. Really appreciate it. Uh, I know you've been busy, especially the last few weeks with racing. Before we get into your career and we go back a little bit, just tell me about what you're up to now and what your life looks like. Um, full-time triathlete, that's my job. Um, sometimes people are a bit surprised that when you say you do it full-time. Uh, so yeah, full-time triathlete, live in Loughborough, um, studied there and have a house there and live there now with my husband, who's also a full-time athlete. He's an ultra runner. Um, so yeah, we live, two dogs, some chickens, tortoise, and <laughs> uh, yeah, do some triathlon on the side. So it's kind of where I'm at now. It seems like, I follow you on social media, it seems like you've got a real good balance to your life. It seems like, you know, you've got the triathlon, but, you know, you've been to university, you've got a degree, you're married, you've got the animals at home, the house. It seems like you've got, you're able to switch off probably quite well. I think the balance has been a real big key point to the success I've managed to have. I think when I don't have that and you put so much into just the training or just the racing it becomes overwhelming and I just can't cope with it right. all going on to one thing. So I think for me personally, I know it's the same for some other people on the on the squad that having the separation of life and training life is one of the biggest things that is important to, to me in my career. Do you have other athletes on your squad that go for a different approach in terms of full in all their eggs in one basket? And have you been able to like, have you almost learned from that? Or did you yourself kind of put everything in one direction and think, actually, I'm, maybe I need to switch pivot here and change my... I've definitely had points where I've been all eggs in one basket. Right. Um, and even now I say like I have a real good balance in my life. There's still been times where I've have slipped back into it's all or nothing on this right, one race. Okay. And I think if that race then doesn't go to plan, it is then like the world is over mm. and it takes a lot to step back and be like, it's not over. It was one race. <laughs> yeah. Your life's not over. You're yeah. not a terrible athlete because you've had one bad race. Um, and I think it just kind of goes back to the the balance in life and having a whole rounded life. And it's not just about triathlon because there is way more to life than just that. Yeah, for sure. I, re I remember when we were at school. So I think Cross Country Club was on a Thursday lunchtime. Yeah. And I can remember someone coming up to me and saying, there's a girl that's really fast in the Cross Country Club. And I was like, really? Yeah, right. And I can remember it that was like the boy's attitude back then, wasn't yeah. it? So I can remember watching and seeing you being really fast yeah. and then leaving primary school. And then kind of I lost touch with everybody that was um, that was that went to Crossdale, then went to South Wolds because I went to a different school. But then started to hear your name pop up again. Where did that passion for running initially come from in the early days when you first started? Was it something your family got you into or did you just kind of come across it? Yeah, I think I kind of fell into it by accident. My, like my parents aren't, you know, sporty. They didn't do sports like growing up or anything like that. And I was, like you say, did stuff at school and, you know, kind of every club I was like putting my hand up to do. Couldn't do anything apart from running really. So like football, couldn't really kick a ball. Rounders, <laughs> I couldn't really hit a ball. But I was just loved doing all those things. Um, and then used to have swim, les swim lessons down at the Ledger Centre. And mum just saw a local triathlon advertised down at Clifton and was like, oh, triathlon. And 20 years ago, like, it definitely wasn't as big as it is now, yeah. you know, kind of you hadn't had the success that the Brownleys had had at the Olympics. Like, no one knew what the sport was, but mum was like, oh, triathlon, like, sounds a bit interesting, we'll go along and do it. And I think there was, like, six of us in the age group, whereas now there's, like, 30, 40 kids per age group, there was, like, six of us. Um, I couldn't even do two-length front crawl. I did, like, one-length front crawl, one-length backstroke. Got out, freezing cold, put one of my mum's T-shirts on that was too big for me because I needed something that I could easily get on when I was wet. Um, she'd put some toggles out of her jumper in my shoes, and had a 50 quid bike from Halfords. So it was proper, like, old school, like, on a budget kind of thing. But I just loved it. And I think I went on and, you know, kind of got my trophy and my medal from it. And when you're eight years old and you get that, you're like, this is so cool. Like, this is amazing. Um, and I think from then it kind of just, like, sparked something, like that competitiveness in it. And I think you obviously have that at school, but it's quite a small pond of people, isn't yeah. it, at school? Whereas when you start like racing other kids and stuff like that, you can't start thinking like, oh, this is really fun and I'm doing quite well and stuff. So it kind of like started then. And then I joined like a swim club and an athletics club and a tri club and did stuff in school holidays and kind of really just step by step really is kind of the theme of my whole career. Like everything has just sort of been, as I got a bit older, something else has come in mm. and it's kind of just gradually 
yeah, got to where it is now. And so you found it pretty early then, eight years old yeah. is when you first started. 20 years. Yeah, that's 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> 20 years yeah, you've been doing it. So I years. did 21 years in my career. Yeah. So you're nearly, you're going to beat me for sure. Well, one more year and then I'm there. <laughs> so, so eight years old is pretty young. And you're right. I like, I'm trying to think back to when I was a kid. I mean, my sport was really left field, especially for a boy. Yeah. But like, yeah, I never really saw anything about triathlon like back it's, then. It, so it must new. have been very niche. It wasn't like, until like 2012 where we got Johnny and Alistair got two medals at the Olympics, and that's when everyone was like, "Bing, home Olympics, yeah. two medals," you know, and everyone started taking an interest in in it and it really grew to the point where now, yeah, like kids' events that are going on are like oversubscribed, like so much is going on. The opportunities are so much more than what it was 20 years ago. Did it, so when 2012 happened, did that, did, was there a real shift there? Did you watch 2012 and think, wow, this is actually, did it almost legitimize the sport that you were doing a little bit? Yeah, because we went, we were actually on a talent camp right. when that happened and we went down and watched the men's race. You kind of had this coach full of kids, like up and coming, you know, 14, 15, 16 year olds. Um, and we were down in London in Hyde Park watching it. And, you know, it was quite cool. We were all there, face paint on, flags type of thing. And it was like, I had never experienced anything like that before. The amount of people that were there, just the vibe, like you talk about the vibe of something and like the mm. feeling of it, like it's quite hard to put into words, just like the emotion that everyone had for a sport. And I hadn't really experienced that because I hadn't, hadn't been to anything on that scale before. Right. Um, so you kind of went and, you know, everyone's cheering for British athletes and British athletes at home games, British athletes have got on the podium. And I think, like, that was a real shift for British triathlon as a whole, um, as well as triathlon as a whole in the UK. Did that coincide with you then starting to do bigger events? At that point, had you, you said you were on, like, a talent ID camp. Uh, you, did you then start to represent Great Britain on a junior level? Yeah, so the first, so we have a thing called like the Youth Olympic, uh, sorry, the Youth Relays. Um, and I, the first show I went was as a travelling reserve, so I didn't even get to race. But I remember okay. kind of going, having this tri suit that said GBR Coldwell on it, like the first one I've ever got. And I wasn't even going to race, but, you know, I kind of got it and I was like, oh my God, like my name is next to GBR on a GBR <laughs> tri suit. And like... Like I said, I didn't even race, but I think for me that was the point where it was like, I really want to race in one of these. Yeah. Um, so that for me was the first, and I would have been, that probably would have been 2010 was the first time okay. that I was kind of like given this try with my name yeah. on it. Um, but then from that, I kind of was fortunate enough that I got selected for yeah junior Europeans, junior worlds, under 23s, junior worlds, European worlds. Um and then started having like a taste of like European Cups, World Cups before I had my first World Series start. So I definitely did everything, yeah. you know, in order. I, yeah. I wasn't one of these athletes that was like, oh, we'll chuck you in at 17 and see what you do and then have some breakthrough race or anything like that. I was a real gradual. Can, can you do that in triathlon? Because I was, when I was looking but ahead of this, when I was looking, I, I Wikipedia everyone. So when I was looking, I was saying, oh, yeah, there's an under 21 and under 23s. Can you go senior at 17 and compete in the Olympic Games? Are there rules around that? Or do they try to stretch your career out a little bit more? So I think because of being British, British athlete within the British system, they definitely don't want you to suddenly be 16 years old and go into the Olympics. Right, OK. Um, that being said, though, they wouldn't... Like, if you were good enough you to do, do it, that. you can do it. There's can nothing you against not you not doing it. Can you step back to juniors? Is, is no, you, a, could. you could. You could, you could do so that like well. the last... I got a medal at like under 23 Worlds and I still had another year left to do it. Right, okay. But at that point, I stepped up and raced yeah. the senior event. Yeah. So, like, people kind of miss maybe the last year or something like that would step up. Um, but you, the problem that you have is as a junior, you race over sprint distance okay. and seniors raced over Olympic. What's considered junior and what's considered senior? What age? Well, probably from the age of 18, you might start thinking about racing an Olympic distance. Okay. But like the step up from a sprint to an Olympic is quite a shift. That'd so you're be, going from okay. 750 swim to 1500. Okay. You're going from a 20k bike to a 40k bike. You're going for a 5k run for a 10k so run. So it's basically double. So it's double. Double the distances. Um, throw into the, you know, throw into that, that it might be somewhere hot. Mm. Like, and then you're racing against, you know, proper senior athletes. Like, that's a real shift to. Yeah to then do that so it's definitely not something that people just oh I'll just go and do an Olympic distance yeah. for some seniors what was it's your not. what was your training looking like when you were at that age when you're first doing those internationals 2010 
2011, 2012 time. What was your what was your training like at that point in time? How so many was, hours were you training? I was fortunate enough that because we live so close to Loughborough, and that's one of the home hubs for British triathlon, that I was going down to swim with the group before swimming. So mum would drive me down and then okay. I'd come back to school. So I was doing that like three times a week plus probably another swim at the weekend. So it's probably something like four times a week. Um, again, I'd go back down to my athletics club was based out of the university and was going out for two run sessions with probably another run outside of the week. And I hardly rode my bike but just because of logistics of being at school all the day. Right. So I maybe ride my bike at the weekend. So I okay. wasn't doing masses. Yeah. Um, the weekends were either, yeah, I was probably racing most weekends, whether it was swim gala, athletics champ, triathlon, whatever it might be. Um so I was probably doing, I don't know, 12 hours a week, right. nothing Out, out of the uh, free disciplines, which was the one that for you came a little bit more naturally? When I was younger, ironically running, which is now the one that takes me more, really, is probably okay. the, the, my weakest out of the three. When I was younger, it was definitely the run and the swim. And then the bike just kind of just did it in the races. Whereas, yeah, now obviously we're riding 12, 14 hours a week, so... What's that jump. split? What's that split like in training like now? Um, between the three? So we'll swim seven and a half hours, something like that in the week, ride 12, 13 hours, and then run five and a half hours, okay. plus a drill session, two gym sessions, some mobility, some physio. Which is so. the one that t- takes like the biggest toll on your body? Would you say running? Yeah. Yeah. I think Just joints wise. Yeah, joints, loading. Like up until like COVID for me was a real blessing in disguise because I got in this real vicious circle of having a great block of training, getting injured, rehabbing, trying to get back for something, having a really four weeks block training, getting injured again. And it was just like this constant like right. vicious circle. Um, and it was all kind of down to run volume really. Like I was trying to double run on a Monday. I was trying to do an extra run on a Saturday. Like... Every run that I was doing was like 10, 15 minutes longer than what I'm doing now. Whereas when COVID hit, I was like, right, this is a reset button because this isn't going to work. Um, so, yeah, we basically, COVID came. We obviously weren't going to race for that year. And it was like, right, let's just go back to a level of what can you do week in, week out, but for the whole year. Yeah. Like, because we're in this pattern of every three, four months, we're missing three, four weeks of training for an overload of this something needs injecting whatever it might be um so yeah basically through covid had the best block of training i've ever had so consistent came out of the back of it fittest i've ever been and we were like why are we going to change this like this works yeah you haven't got injured the consistency has done you wonders um so yeah ended up ironically i probably train less on paper in a week now yeah. than i did four years ago but if you look at that over a six, eight, twelve week block, it's way more than I would yeah. have done. So when you say we, who are you referring to? Like, is that is your program athlete led or is it t- me and my coach? You and your coach. So, I mean, so before was it was it you wanting yeah. to do more? Uh, it, no, probably a combination of both. It was right, probably okay. like. I needed to be better at running, so we kind of put a bit more running in, okay. but I just couldn't cope with that much running. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the decision was made, yeah, and the okay. decision to do less was was an athlete led decision. Okay. Um, but I've been working with my coach Adam f- f- since I was fifteen, right, fourteen, okay, fifteen. Yeah, so he knows so you really well. Yeah we've, yeah, we've got a really good relationship. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like um, it sounds like you do, and you've got that team, and you've. I think every athlete has to go through basically making loads of mistakes to figure yeah. out what they can't do. I found myself in that vicious circle all of the time, getting injured, trying to get back as fast as I could. And you get, and getting that's more the thing, injured you try and get and fast. Just, yeah, because in the time that you're out competing, everybody else is still racing yeah. or they're getting competition results and you think, I've got to get back as so fast as I can. you end up doing more and, and then you're injured again. Yeah, and, and you do more. Yeah. And then, yeah it, yeah, it can be a vicious circle that yeah. seems to... So I think to, COVID was a real... Blessing in disguise. Blessing in disguise. And then how, how was that time... So, because a lot of athletes that come on in this still competing i ask about that time with covid where were you in the mix for like the the games in tokyo going into it were you so i'd missed selection going into tokyo so it was the selection for us was done in 2019 right um we had a bit of a controversial selection because of a few things the test event where the selections were made and disqualifications and stuff so it was a bit of a controversial selection at the time but the team was selected 
fine. Quite early as well. So 2019. 2019 so you it was knew selected. at 2019. I hadn't okay. gone in. Um, and that was probably why when COVID did hit, it was like, well, I'm not going to the Olympics anyway. Yeah, so like, can really take we can time. really take my time to do it. And then as it was, obviously the games then got postponed and the team never really got revised. So, yeah, that whole Olympic period like was really hard because mm. had that team been selected in 2020, I fully believe I would have been on that start right, line. Okay. Um, was that the first time you sat and watched an event and thought, I should have been there? Yeah. yeah. Like I'd gotten World Series podiums by that point and that's one of the great and horrific things about being from GB is that honestly if I was from any other nation bar probably the States I'd have been at that Olympic Games yeah. same with next year like whether yeah. I go or not go if I was from any other team bar the Americans I know I'd be on that start yeah. line without a shadow of doubt and that's obviously really tough when you're from GB but on the flip side like we have great support coaching support staff budget to go to camps yeah. and stuff like that so it's really difficult because would I be where I am now if I wasn't from GB yeah, you don't exactly, know yeah, yeah. so and what uh, what are the sizes of the team men's and women that go to a games so you can have up to three men three women okay currently we've got three women select uh, three women um, spots for the games but, but we've only got not, two but not chose not chosen going. yet they'll okay. probably do first round they'll do first round of selections at the end of this year and what does that mean does that mean picking the first spot or they can pick up to three this year if they decide if they want to. yeah right and is it all is it down to the discretion of the head of the program so there's like automatic selection points discretion points there's like is it done on numbers completely or not is it not no. completely black and white okay the problem with our sport is it's not like how fast have you run 100 metres? Okay, you're the quickest person. Or, you know, like, what was your score in, in your gymnastics routine? Oh, is this, I'm the best person at that. Like, it's yeah. it's not as clear-cut as that. Like, as can be on one day of the week, someone goes and wins, the next day of the week, somebody else goes and wins. Yeah. Because the course is different. One person makes a breakaway, it doesn't make a breakaway. There is a breakaway that's not a breakaway. Like, How do you feel about that? Do you feel like... It causes me a lot of stress. Yeah. And I think no. I really struggle with that. Because it's the same in mine as well. So you'd think it's just scores, but it's not. No. It's not just scores, no. It's all... It's. There's always a little bit of discretion in at the, the bottom that comes down to the head of program gets the oh, final say. Okay. Yeah, so that... So even if you're top yeah, ranked, really? Yeah. It's a lot more like that now because... Yeah. Post-2016, there was a lot of appeals that went in. So they now steer towards being right. a lot more black and white results. Yeah. So there's not been too many controversial decisions okay. in the last... Okay, but there had been. But there still is. Yeah. There's still a lot of scope and room for moving around, which can cause a lot of issues. Because for me, my attitude was always like, look, I just want to see... Like yeah. one, two, three, four, five. And then it's easy. If I'm not in the top five, it's Fair not play. a problem. Yeah. yeah. So I... So does do you find that hard? Do you think there's a way in which they could do it? So it would just be... They have done it in like, we know the races that you need to perform at. Could they just pick, select three races and say, if you want to go, you've got to be so in So they have, race. so they're like, there's two events, the test event and the grand final for us. If you podiumed at both of those, you were in, no questions asked. Okay, like that right. was automatic, right. you're in. Yeah. Um, did any, has anyone done that? One person we've only we've only had one event and we've got okay, one right. more coming. Right. One per one girl's medaled at one and if she medals at the next one she'll, she'll be she'll in. Go. Um yeah. and then I'm next in line in terms of things that I've hit on the discretionary policy. Uh -huh. Whether or not they choose to select two of us this year, even though I've not hit automatic. Yeah. I don't know. How so, do you Because uh, I we're like a year out right from mm -hmm. Paris and you've already said that Tokyo was tough. How do you feel when someone asks you about Paris? Like what are the feelings that you get you get? excitement, nerves, pressure, stress? I think because I haven't stamped my ticket to go yet, it's probably like more of like a feeling of dread mm. rather than a feeling of like, I'm going to be an Olympian. Yeah. Because like, I feel like it's so close to going, but I'm not there. And everyone's like, oh, but you're like, you know, you've had two World Series podiums, you won your first World Series this year, like, of course you're going to go, like, blah, blah, blah. And you think... You like to think that, but you never know what's going to happen. And mm. I think, like, that's hard when you're sat there and you're like, I know if I was from another nation, yeah, I'd be going. And I know that because you're from GB and the, the strength and depth that we have, it's not guaranteed. And honestly, I don't know if I have 
the mental capability to do another Olympic cycle to try and become an Olympian. Right, okay. So I kind of feel like... Has that been your dream? As You know, when you were a little kid and you started doing triathlon, yeah. like at what point did the Olympics become, you know, this thing that you started to this story you started to tell yourself inside your head, was it from quite a young age? The first, my first memory of the Olympics was watching Kelly Holmes. Okay. And remembering, like, how everyone was like, oh, she's such a comeback queen, and, like, you know, the story that she had and where she came from and, like, what she achieved. And that was probably the first time that I was like, like, this is the Olympics. Like, this is what it's about. And that's probably, for me, the first time where I was like, this would be really cool to go. And at the time, I was doing more, like, track stuff as well. Okay. So I kind of... You resonated with her Resonated with more, yeah. me doing that. Yeah. Um, and then as I've gotten older and you start seeing, you know, people I'd go on camps with or, you know, the older athletes that would come in and do stuff with the younger ones or I'd train with them down at Loughborough and stuff like that, then you start thinking, God, it, like, it's actually, like, real? Yeah. I don't know if, like, you kind of... Even now, I suppose, when you see, like, you know, the superstars and the big names in athletics and, you know, the swimming and, and you know, those sp sports that I follow, you kind of... They almost seem, like, surreal. Like, mm. they're not just, like, normal people, you know. They don't go home to their dogs and take the dog out for a walk. They're just really, like, odd. So I think when I first went to Loughborough and those people were getting in the pool like I was and joking around before we got in swimming, I think when it became real, I was like, whoa, this is this is me, like, I yeah, could do this. Yeah. And I think that, for me, was, like, the first point for triathlon where I was thinking, oh, Olympics, oh, that'd be really cool. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, then, obviously, around Rio, I kind of was starting to race World Series. I was obviously nowhere near meeting selection or anything like that, but kind of was racing the races that I'd need to race. And then, yeah, around Tokyo, like, I definitely felt I was good enough to be on that start line, mm. which was hard to take when I wasn't. I was out in Tokyo as a travelling reserve again, and it was awful. Um, what was that experience like for you being a travelling reserve in Tokyo? Because oh. from all of the athletes I've had come on that have been to Tokyo have all said, you know, I, I kind of asked, I had a lad called Joe Fraser on the gymnast. I said, Joe, what was it like? Because I imagine you close your eyes when you were a kid and you imagine, like, the, the stands being full and your family there, and it just wasn't the dream that you were sold. Yeah. How was that experience? And then what was it like being a travelling reserve? Because I bet you were segregated even more from yeah. the team, right? And I think you literally were segregated. Were you outside the village as well? Outside the village. Yeah. Um, obviously, COVID was on. So, like, once we dropped into Tokyo, I couldn't leave my room unless we were going to the swimming pool or to run on a treadmill. And were you running... Oh, you're just running on your own? Yeah, on a treadmill. Yeah, not with the team, so just, just on um, the Because they all had accreditation, so they could, like, get out and okay. go on the bike course and stuff like that. So... Yeah, the literally the only times that I left the room was to go and like get food from the restaurant that we had in the hotel, um, to go to the swimming pool or to run on the treadmill. And were you there the whole were you there the whole time or pretty much the whole they time? Raced. Yeah. Did you go home once? They then I went started? home. Yeah, basically just after the relay happened. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it was it was really difficult, and I just don't think. British triathlon really knew how hard it was going to be. Like, mm. going as a travelling reserve... I suppose the difference was the guy who went as the men's travelling reserve, he knew that he wouldn't have been on the start line regardless of if they'd have picked it again okay, in 20... 20... so he was there like... He was like, this is cool. What yeah, a, yeah. One experience. We've got the kit. Like, we're here supporting an Olympics, yeah. whatever. Whereas I was like, I do not want to see another piece of GB kit again in my life. Like, yeah. hated it. Like, segregated... It was just it was really difficult, and I think because you're in that situation, and it was completely different to other Olympics when you've had travelling reserves go out and stuff like that. That mm. no one really knew like kind of what to do with me, so I was kind of just trying to prepare for my own races. I was sat like top five in the overall World Series rankings, so I was trying to do my own thing whilst being in Tokyo. Couldn't leave the room, and it yeah, was just just stuck in limbo. Yeah, and I remember yeah. one of the um, support staff had brought some like Cadbury chocolate out of her and I love chocolates so you know So and she came and gave me this chocolate and I remember just like looking at it and I nearly like burst into tears like <laughs> of this bar of chocolate and yeah. I just thought this is not good like I yeah. need to go home like <laughs> I'm literally crying because someone's giving me some dairy milk I was yeah. like this is ridiculous when you got back from that how quickly did you like switch around and did, was it almost like because when I was when I missed a competition or I was a travelling reserve or I was injured 
I always felt, well, once a competition's finished, I'm back in the race so I can, yeah. is, I'm back in for the next one then. Did you have that, those kind of feelings or was it, did it take you a bit of time? Was there still quite a lot of frustration or like anger there? Yeah, Were you a able lot. to turn that into like a positive force going into your training or not really? I raced well for the rest of the year, but then it also triggered seeking down a sports psychology, psychiatrist okay. route. So that kind of triggered all of that for me because I just found it really difficult to fully put it all behind me and fully prepare to try and go to an Olympics myself. Did you try and just block that out? Or did yeah, you... I'm a real head in the sand kind of like, athlete. Shove everything in the cupboard, shut the door. Yeah, and yeah. hope for the best and shock it. Was that the work. first time you'd had a conversation with a sports psychologist? Or I had... Um, when I was younger, I kind of was in a, a bit of an abusive relationship and kind of all came out within a triathlon camp that we were on and no one really had known about it and I kind of got forced into speaking to a sports psychologist right. when I was younger um, and got on really well with her kind of was the first time I'd ever spoke to anyone about it and stuff like that and she was lovely and kind of kept in contact then she left and I was like well this whole issue that I had is kind of gone he wasn't around anymore, wasn't in, in the training environment. So I was like, oh, I'm fine now. This is great. Um, so kind of didn't really need it. Yeah. And then when I got into Loughborough Uni, I'd obviously moved and kind of opened up the door to more of the s support that we had within the programme. And I thought, oh, sports psychology, yeah, I'm doing my degree and it's stressful and you kind of, you know... So then started kind of having some conversations, but we didn't really gel. Like, she was really okay. nice, but we just didn't yeah. just didn't gel very well. So kind of was like, oh, well, I'm fine. It is what it is. I don't, I didn't really need it anyway. And then around the whole Olympic stuff was probably when I was like, I literally can't cope right now. Mm. I, need, I need something because this is not working out for me. Um, so kind of went back to British Triathlon and they were really good actually at the start. They were kind of like, you know, we have, this is the sports psychology option. And I was like, look, it's just not for me and we're just not gelling and it's just not working. And I ended up getting through Boopa some sports psychiatrist sessions, um, which kind of like opened up my eyes to sports psychology and mindset and stuff a bit because I think... If my coach was to turn around to me tomorrow and say, I can't coach you anymore, and I had to find a new coach, I could very easily be like, I know what I need, I know what I'm looking for in a coach, I know kind of what I need to do. Whereas because I'd never gone with sports psychology, it was kind of like, well, what are you looking for? And I was like, some help. Do you know what <laughs> yeah. I mean? I didn't Yeah. I didn't really know what I wanted. I knew I needed some help, but I didn't know what it looked like. Um, so, yeah, I started working with Alan um, kind of once a month, just a real chat, like kind of try some things that did work, try some things that didn't work and just kind of like open my eyes to what could be done and just the power of talking to someone and not just putting your head in yeah. the sand and hoping for the best. Initially, how much of that was when you first started speaking to him, how much of it was just literally just talking about life? A lot. Yeah. And like, then has it now switched to more sports-specific stuff like competing? Yeah, the first... The first ones I had were like, we were talking about stuff in childhood, like my parents divorcing, like right, we went okay. right back to stuff and I was thinking, God, I what thought we were literally <laughs> talking about Tokyo Olympics yeah. and, you know, here we were talking about like my guest list for my wedding and stuff like that and I was like, <laughs> this is not what I had in mind. Um, whereas, yes, I kind of had finished the sessions with him and then we had a new sports psychologist okay. come in with British Triathlon yeah. and it was a lot better for me because then I could be like, right, this is what I've done, this is what I think works kind of thing. Um, and now... I'd say it's like 80% sport, 20% life. Yeah. Um, and that's something that you still do now? Yeah, so I catch yeah. up with him every other week, one in three, something like that. Um, it's still something that I'm definitely working on to be better okay. at. Um, and when you say you're working on to be better at, to be better at what exactly? Being open, Okay. I think. I think I always say that I've got, you know, kind of like a bucket that, you know, you can just fill up with as much life stress sports stress whatever and I'm really good at just filling it up like this is great life's fine yeah put more stress in it's fine and then all of a sudden like there's no more room and it just like just explodes. explodes and at that right. point I can't I have no mechanisms so like just been working on how do we not get to that point like yeah. how do we 
how do we keep life stresses and sports stresses because they all kind of amalgamate into one yeah. you know like if you have a life stress you're probably not sleeping very well then you're not going to train very well because yeah. you're not trained very well you're even more stressed because you're not training very well so it all you know it all feeds into each other um so for, yeah for, for people that are because there'll be a lot of athletes that feel a similar way and that analogy is used quite a lot for the mm-hmm. bucket you know this next 12 months probably going to be pretty stressful right so what are the type of things that you now are doing to try and mitigate you get into that point where everything explodes some of it's just saying to him so like we had a um, thing a few weeks ago and i could feel myself just being like i could burst into tears at this point like there was just so much going on i was so stressed i could if someone asked me how i was feeling i think i'd burst into tears and i just messaged him and i was like this is happening and even just by like telling someone yeah you're just like, oh, I feel like I'm all right lighter. now. I'm a bit, yeah. I'm a bit freer now that I've just, even though I've like nothing's been said back to me. Yeah. But just because somebody else knows, it's fine. And like then you obviously, feel a bit safer that someone knows yeah. where you're at. And I think as well, like the difference of you know, someone says to me, why do you not speak to Tom about it? Why do you not speak to your husband about it? And I think because I know what he's going to say, he's going to be like, it's fine, you're fine. I'm here if I need to help you, which is lovely. But I know what he's going to say to me, whereas. I think the thing that sports psychology and has given me is that it's someone that's not my husband, my mom, my mm-hmm. coach, close friends, like whatever it is. It's it's someone who I just see on a you know biweekly basis or whatever. They're not emotionally involved, no. are they? So the advice they're giving you is not tinged with protection. Yeah, and, and they... I think that when you're the athlete, you kind of think, are you just saying that because you love me, or are you saying that because <laughs> yeah. you actually think? Yeah, that's true, and I th- and I think that's the biggest thing that it's probably given me what's, is that. What's that dynamic life? Uh, dynamic light, because obviously your husband is an athlete as well. How do you manage that? Uh, does it suit your guy's lifestyle? Because I'm guessing you train similar ways. Uh, I'm sure he races. He's doing ultra, yeah. like ultra races, right? What's that like? How's that impacted your life? And how much does that? seeing him go through his experience, does that kind of give you a bit of perspective for then, oh, I need to like not take everything so seriously on my side? I think it definitely has mellowed me in terms of like having him around more because, you know, when you have someone else who's the top of their game but in a different sport, it gives you does give you a different perspective on stuff. You know, like he had a horrific knee injury, surgery, was out for ages, um missed a load of racing and stuff and like he's still come back from that and you know he's won some incredible races like this year and I think having someone else go through it you kind of like bounce off each other you know like when he's having a shit time but you're having a good time you're both having good times you're both having bad times like you understand it like you understand that you come in from a session and it might only seem like one session but to you it seems like the world but he might have also had a crap session yeah. and he's like, hey, Sophie, it doesn't matter, it's just one session, like, yeah. you'll be fine tomorrow. Um, but I think the fact that we kind of, like, came into our relationship both knowing where we were, because, like, this year we've been, like, passing ships for a lot of it, like, right. you know, we won't see each other three, four, five, six weeks at a time, then I might go home for a week and then he's off for a few weeks. So I think, like, sometimes that's hard, especially because, like, as I said earlier, like, home life for me is a real comfort comfort place comfort time yeah. and then when you're on your own you're a bit like oh it's not as good now yeah. <laughs> I have to do all the cooking myself um, so yeah and I think because he's in a sport that's similar like we do do stuff together like he runs with me like he'll come out on his bike and stuff with me so like he helps out a lot with my training as well as the life style stuff like all jokes aside he does do all the cooking he does do all the prep the shopping and stuff like that so it just takes the pressure off yeah takes the pressure off you and yeah allows you a bit more me a bit more space and stuff to do you find that there's a difference between say athletes that you're around and the world that you're in preparing for an olympic games is there a difference between a noticeable difference between that kind of pressure and then say like a, a big race that your husband's preparing for is there a difference yeah yeah i think because the racing that tom does is the top few athletes are professional and very good and they'll be making money and it's the kudos of winning these big races. But in the same race, there's this whole spectrum of athletes and some of them will be going to, you know, these 100-mile races just to complete it. Right. And I remember going to... I was out in Chamonix for UTMB last year and I've never experienced 
the sheer joy that everyone has, whether you win the race or the guys that were finishing last. Like, it wasn't about being the fastest. Yeah. I mean, it is for the top 10, 15 guys in that race, but it's for 99% in that, of that race, it was about completion. So Tom's, you know, finished 10 hours later, 12 hours later, these other people are finishing. And people are still out in Chamonix, like, cheering these people on. And that, for me, was, like, really weird because <sighs> every race that I ever do or go and watch... If you're not up at the front, like... It's a failure. It's a failure. Yeah. And it kind of... Being there last year was the first time I properly watched a trail race. And it really did, like... I don't know, it made me think, like, this is should be what sport's about. Yeah. And it's really difficult when, you know, you talk about the Olympics and selection and funding and all these things because you really get, like pigeonholed into you need to perform you need to perform it's about doing this i know it's not all about that but fundamentally that's what it comes yep, down yeah, to it is it's medals right it <laughs> is it's medals it's and that's what the whole of british triathlon needs it needs olympic medals to get our funding from uk sport to carry on mm. to have british triathlon that's you know that's kind of what it is whereas yeah you go over to you know an amateur sport that's slowly turning professional at the top and it's so different. Yeah. And and even talking to Tom, like when he comes back from from races and stuff, it's never about, oh, it was amazing because I won. It's, oh, you should have seen the people that were out supporting at the aid stations then these kids were running alongside me and stuff yeah. like that. And it's a real shift in what I view as elite sport and what sport's about. Yeah, and that must be, I think that's, that's almost like a, a real blessing to be able to see that mm. whilst you're still in the eye of the storm yeah. of this. Because I think most athletes get to that place where they start to go, hang on a minute, why did I start this in the first place? Oh, yeah, I loved it. Yeah. That's what it was about. And I think I probably lost that a bit yeah. through the, through the But Olympic I think stuff. that's normal. I think it's almost impossible not to. And actually, I think if you got to the place where I did at the end of my career where I was just doing it because I loved it, I never would have been successful yeah. before, you know? So, But I do think at the end, towards the end, you start to think about that. Maybe it's it's a real positive for you to see that mm. side of sport whilst you're still in the in thick it. of it, yeah. if that makes sense. So that was a real thing. Like, UTMB is actually this weekend, and I wasn't going to go out. I wasn't going to go out. And I was like, do you know what? I need to go out. Mm. And whether Tom wins, DNFs, like, whatever it might be, it's kind of, like, irrelevant because... I know that whatever happens, it, those few days being there, up a mountain with people running around, like, it sounds so basic, but it's just, like, the joy that it brings people yeah. is just unbelievable. And that'll be a memory as well. Yeah. Whereas you'll look back and in five years' time, if I say to you, what, what you training that sessions were you doing? <laughs> you won't have a clue, do you know no. what I mean? Whereas you'll remember that because yeah. you were there, like, yeah. with him. I think you start to, like, I think you start to make sac less sacrifices that, I think you make a lot of sacrifices that potentially lead you to being unhappy when you're in elite sport mm -hmm. and that starts to shift as you kind of get yeah. towards the end a little bit more but, I think because the the ups and downs are so much more heightened when you're elite sport you know like when you're a kid and you're young or whatever like you have a bad race what are you unhappy for the rest of the day you go and get a McDonald's yeah. and you're probably fine again do you know what I mean yeah. and Likewise, if you have a good race, oh, it was great, and then you go back to school on a Monday and you're like, oh, we're back to school now. Whereas now those highs and lows are so much more, yeah, like they're just so much bigger, you know. And do you, I yeah, do you feel like right now, the headspace that you're in, do you feel like you will define yourself off whether or not you go to an Olympic Games or not? Your career, your career, not yourself. <sighs> Do you feel like you're in that headspace at the moment? Because I used to be there all of the time. Probably to an extent, yeah. yes. So that's still, your the value is really placed on. I think because it's just, it is the it's so of iconic, sport, you right? know? Yeah. And I won my first World Series this year, wasn't expected. It was kind of, I'd got on some podiums, but I definitely wasn't a regular podiumer. Um, won this first one, I remember thinking like, if I never do this again, I've done it once. Mm. And that was kind of, at that point, was enough for me. That if I never got another World Series podium, I've won one. Like, that's more than a lot of athletes will say in their career. But then very quickly came back to the... The next thing. The next thing. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's the problem, in like, for me in elite sport, is mm. that you very quickly go from... 
wasn't expecting to ever get on a World Series podium. Oh, I've gotten one. Oh, I've gotten another one. I've got another one. I've got another one. Oh, my God, I've won one. Yeah. Oh, my God, you've won one. That's amazing. Okay, yeah, but I really want to make Olympic Games. Yeah. And I just hope that whatever happens next year, whether I go, don't go, win a medal, finish last, like whatever happens, that I kind of can be in a headspace to decide what I want to do from like a happy point of view yeah. rather than trying to prove something to myself, to other people, like to whatever, because like I have done stuff in my career and yeah. it shouldn't be defined by the Olympics. But then there is part of me that's like, but it's the Olympics. <laughs> and I would hate to get to the end of next yeah. year, whether I go whatever and think I've just had enough yeah. and kind of leave tainted or like... Yeah, you don't want that. Do you know what I mean? Uh, or, or yeah. you know, I decide to go on for another four years for the wrong reasons. like, And I think that's what's difficult when rightly or wrongly you put so much onto an Olympics that happen every four years. Yeah. What what does lie between the space between where you are right now and being on that plane to Paris next year? What what does that space look like? What do you have to do to in order for you to potentially be one of the girls going? What would you have to do? So it's just a couple more races. We've got the grand final end of this year. Um, if I could put in a good performance there, that could potentially trigger being discretionary selected this year. If not, it'll come down to a race next year and it'll kind of be first one, two, across the post, we'll, we'll go. And where, when would that race be next year? Probably like May. Okay, so quite late. May, June. Yeah, quite late. Yeah, it's precious. It takes me back to... <laughs> yeah. I left it until like June before mm -hmm. 2012 and they picked the team like the week after and it was, yeah, it was left very late. Yeah. Similar thing in Rio, but then I was the one that kind of missed out. But I remember very clearly, like, it's interesting, like, I really enjoy speaking to athletes that are still in it because you get a different energy. Mm -hmm. like, when I've had conversations with athletes that are retired, it's a bit, they're a bit more relaxed, but yeah. you can feel the... Do you think the, you would have done anything different? Um, like the headspace that you were in? So what was really interesting was but prior to Tokyo, so like 2019, realistically, I was never going to go. It was like a... I, the problem with me was that, like, I threw a Hail Mary in 2012 and somehow pulled it off and I shouldn't have. And then I kind of did the same thing in 2016. Mm -hmm. I had, there was no way I should have done what I did. And I was a, similar to you, like, on paper, numbers-wise, I felt that I should have gone yeah. if it was purely on numbers. Um, so I was the guy that missed out. But then in 2019, when I started to really struggle with my mental health and just f I was doing that spiral of getting injured, but it had really started to affect me mentally more yeah. than physically. And when I went into therapy, I remember sitting there in one of my sessions in therapy and they started very similar to like your sports psychology sessions. It was all about my life first and then kind of... The, the things that You're I You're like, this isn't what, what we're meant to be talking about. What I yeah. thought were the issues were kind of just surface level, and then it was other stuff. A lot of it was my identity being tied up to gymnastics and all of that, but I sat there one day for like five minutes just looking out the window and didn't say anything, and then I said to her, I'm scared that I'll go to Tokyo and I'll feel like I do right now the day after I finish competing. And she was like, well, yeah. is it worth it? Like... And so I actually switched my mindset a little bit after that. But ultimately, like, you were never going to be able to change my headspace. Like, no. people tried, but I was just, I wasn't, I wasn't built like that. I had to figure it out myself. I think, for me, uh, I always say to, like, athletes now, like, the, you've got to aim for this point where you, you're, you physically mature and emotionally and mentally mature at the right time and they collide. Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> and, and for me, I, I, like, I got there in my head mm -hmm. when my body was already done. Yeah. Yeah, it was, you know, I peaked super early and I just didn't catch up with that. My maturity levels was just yeah. nowhere near where I need they needed to be at 21, 22, 23. So I, I think was, it's like what you said about the identity thing, like like when you look back on your career, do you think that you were defined by 2012? Not really. I think uh the Olympics is an amazing thing because it is everything you think it is and it's not all yeah. at the same time. And, like, it did change my life. Like, you know, for the rest of my life I get to be an Olympian. I didn't really understand what that was. But for me there was a lot of shame and guilt tied to my Olympic Games. Like, I felt that I didn't... I My inner feelings were that I didn't deserve this medal because I made a mistake in the final. So I was like, hold on a minute. <laughs> I can't compute this. 
I've fell off and won an Olympic medal. How does that work? Like, I've failed, but I've still won a medal. Yeah. And everyone around me is, like, celebrating. But inside, I'm feeling like, you're actually thinking I'm a fraud, and I don't deserve to... And I carried that around with me for, like, three or four years. Mm-hmm. So the, it was a, it's a difficult one for me. Now being retired and having made peace with a lot of stuff, I'm so proud of that kid that was 19 and fell off in front of 20,000 people and still got back up and finished his routine. Because if I fell again, then we really would have lost a medal. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But in that yeah. moment to like fall down, turn my head on, 20,000 people went <gasps> like that. And I've gone, right, concentrate, keep yeah. calm. Because I still had to let go of the bar and catch it again, like two more times, I think, in that routine. I still did it. So now I look back and go, wow, how did he do that did, at 19? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Whereas at the time when I was in it, I couldn't do that. And I think you'll feel the same way. I think whenever you do decide to walk away from whether it's, Olympic triathlon and then you carry on doing triathlon I don't know what you're going to do but the further you are removed the more you appreciate what you did and I think the beautiful thing about where I've got to now is that there are a lot of things in my career that were very negative things that I that I wish hadn't happened but it's always that thing right I wouldn't change it though yeah you're like well then you can't really be too angry at it but I can kind of put them to one side and see all the positives now Mm -hmm. rather than just the negatives you say about like the 19 year old like we're all just human and yeah. I think I think people forget that and I think the athlete forgets that as well sometimes that you're kind of so caught up in this world champs medals funding games sponsorship like all these things that you forget like fundamentally like we're human we have good days and bad days and your kids yeah and it just you're a, tra- you're a kid. <laughs> it just so happens that everyone sees your shit days yeah. you know like yeah people in every walk of life have bad days they're just not well now they're not plastered over tv social media instagram like they're everywhere mm. and i think like that plays a big part that everyone sees it and i think like i've probably struggled with that bit that you can't just walk away because everyone's tweeting about it or instagramming it and it's yeah. seen and replayed and you're kind of like reminded about it all the time so i think that's been difficult but then you fundamentally think God, I'm trying to be the best in the world at something. Like, the amount of people on this planet and I'm one of the top 10 in the world. Like, not 10 in the country, like 10 in the world at something. Like, but I don't, like you say, I don't think you fully respect that until until you you come away with it and you think, oh, I was actually quite good at that. Yeah, it it takes some time. Yeah. You need a gap, there needs to be a bit of space and a bit of a gap between you finishing and then you kind of like looking back and going, "Whoa, well, actually, I did that. That's was really right. cool." Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure, definitely, yeah. I found that. Um, what you just mentioned it there. What is your relationship like with social media and stuff? I. Are you conscious of the devil that it is? Oh, hundred yeah. percent. I definitely play the game of it. Um, you know, we're in a sport that has grown so much, but so much of that is through social media. And, you know, we're very fortunate that we have, you know, Super League Triathlon that have come in and elevated sport to a new level, but it's all about promoting the sports through social media and TV and stuff and interviews outside of it and um, reels and all this kind of stuff. You know, it's, it's all kind of come on, but... You know, I love it and hate it all at the same time. I love it because it's, you know, given sponsorship opportunities and stuff like that, which I probably wouldn't have got without it. And being able to show a side that's me outside of triathlon, which I think is really important. And it's probably given me a platform to do that for younger kids and stuff. You know, we were racing at London this weekend and they came up to me and they're like, how are your dogs? How are your chickens? Like, we love following you. Like, we love seeing what you're up to. And, you know, we love seeing you going in your camper van and stuff like that. And I think because I come across just pretty normal and just like what I'm like, generally, like they can relate to that a lot easier than people that just post about these epic training sessions that they do. But then on the flip side, like you constantly see stuff and you know, people say crappy things and try and put other people down and stuff like that. So it's definitely, definitely has its good bits and bad bits. Are you able to block out that noise? See it for what it is? Do you get any of that? I mean, like, you get quite a, you do get a bit in gymnastics, to be fair. Is We've it? had, we had like a home race um, on the World Series in Sunderland and because it where it fell, like not a lot of Brits were actually did it because it was basically a couple of weeks before the test event and, 
it just didn't fit very well for a lot of us, so we didn't go. And like I had loads of messages from people basically saying like that I was disrespectful and like that I should have gone to the race because and like I should have supported a home race and the amount of fans and age groupers that were there to support and that I couldn't be bothered to turn up and stuff. And like I found that hard that people took the time yeah. out of their day to message me messages like that, and I was yeah. like, oh my god! Like, and that's really the first time I just thought this is unbelievable. Like, yeah. you know. And, you know, I'm I'm quite good that I don't search for stuff. You know, if I've had a bad race, whatever, I don't purposely look for crappy comments, but they still pop up now and again. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, the devil of the social media. What do you feel like, so let's say next year you go or you don't go. You were saying to me a bit before the podcast, you don't feel like you might have another cycle. What does, what does the, your future in triathlon look like? Can you retire from competing for Great Britain like at the Olympic Games and then just carry on competing? I know you did did the league this this weekend. Yes, yeah, so there's definitely opportunities and more opportunities are arising now. So we have, yeah, obviously all the Olympic ITU kind of racing that falls under UK sport and UK funding and that kind of umbrella of stuff. Uh, but now you kind of have, yeah, the Super League triathlon, which is short, fast racing that kind of is back end of the race, four or five races in a series. Um, that's kind of one bit. And then there's another umbrella of races that fall under the PTO. And that's like middle distance, long distance racing. Um, so there's definitely options that if, you know, I didn't want to be in that bubble anymore, that mm. I could continue to race, make a living, enjoy enjoy it. Yeah. But, you know, not doing the same, what I'd call high pressure. Yeah. Olympic racing. Do you think you've got that within you? Not to do the high pressure Olympic racing? <laughs> I don't know because it's kind of like yeah. it's all I've ever known. You seem quite like all or nothing. Yeah, and I by nature. I don't know. You know, you put yourself through 25, 28 hours of training a week, crappy winter weather, like some of it's really shitty. And I put myself through that because of the highs that it brings. And I'm yeah. not sure if I'd get that same feeling if I didn't have, you know, world titles or Olympic Games yeah. or in in that. If you were doing it purely for... Because I guess with that league, you're getting paid quite good money. Mm -hmm. So if it was just for the money, you don't feel like... And that's the thing, It like, would get you up out of bed to, to do the runs and do the work. Would you need to? Do you know what I mean? Like... It, for you, is triathlon like Olympic racing, do you know what I mean? I don't know, because I think, like, you know, we just raced Super League at the weekend, and I loved it. It was I enjoyed it. Yeah. And I probably enjoy that level of racing more than the ITU stuff, but the ITU stuff has got the stuff that I really want to achieve. Yeah. So that being said, like, there probably is scope for me to do this stuff over here, because uh -huh. fundamentally it would just be about enjoyment. Yeah. And I enjoy triathlon every yeah, day, yeah. you know, I... Firstly, I don't know any different. But secondly, like, I enjoy training with the group, running with my dog, you know, all those things I enjoy doing. So there probably would be scope for me to do this stuff over here. But then there's also life stuff, you know, like, do we want to have a family? Do we yeah. want to travel? Do I want to support Tom more? Do I want to go and watch him racing? And I think, like, as I've gotten older and, you know, friends have started you know, kind of like being on those journeys and stuff. We got married last year. It makes you think like, oh, it's not just, you know what I mean? I'm not going to just do this till I'm 50. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? You start yeah. thinking, oh, there is more to life than just sport. Yeah. What you want in life changes as yeah. you're older, right? What you yeah. wanted five years ago is very different probably to what, what you, you want, want now. now. Yeah. yeah. What do you, what are your hopes, Sophie, for the next 12 months in your career and then personally outside of triathlon? Sounds very cliche, but I'd love to make the Olympics. Mm -hmm. I think everything I've put into the last couple of years, the decisions that I've made around racing, training, I have done to try and make an Olympic Games. So that for me is like, that's it really. I kind of, that's what I want to do, that's what I want to achieve. And then, you know, the Games would have happened this time in 12 months' time. So if in 12 months' time I can sit there having done that, and be in a headspace to make the decisions from a positive place about what the next stage of my career looks like. That's where I want to be. I don't want to. I don't want to make a decision whether I stay in sport, don't stay in sport, go long course, 
whatever it might be, I don't want to make that decision because I'm so unhappy. Mm-hmm. I want to kind of get off, get to after Paris and be like, I'm actually okay with what's happened or I'm ecstatic with what's happened, you know, if it all goes amazingly, but make that decision because I'm I'm happy and I'm in a good place. Yeah. It's amazing what you've achieved so far. Like, to start at eight years old in a sport that wasn't really... You know, there was no career path, right? No. It was a bit like my sport. <laughs> there, was, there wasn't a blueprint that you could follow. Um, when, when you think back now to that, like, little girl that was eight years old, what, uh, what piece of advice would you give her? If you imagine that was someone else, but it's you, what advice would you give her, knowing what you know now as you approach the dream that, you know, started pretty much when you were eight years old? It's funny because I actually got asked that by a little girl yesterday when we were at, um, at the weekend down in London. And she said, oh, like, what would you give me? And again, it sounds so cliche, but it's just about that enjoyment of it. And I think I'm so fortunate that my day-to-day life, I take racing aside because it obviously has the high bits and the low bits, but day-to-day life, living at home with Tom, with the group that I have, the friends that I have, the training setup that I have, 